In the 120 years from 1500 to the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, Europe was caught in a number of conspiracies and political intrigues directed toward moving Europe toward a magical and alchemically based society. Uh, the Protestant princes of the Northern League of Germany, especially Frederick the Elector Palatine, came to culminate this movement, but its roots lie further back in the 1580s of the 16th century. It was in this period that the English astrologer, astronomer, mathematician, navigator, and expert of espionage, John Dee, launched his famous and mysterious mission to Bohemia, a little-known incident in European history which holds clues to understanding the fate and evolution of modern science and the nature of a lost world of magical and alchemical thinking that once claimed the attention of the European imagination. John Dee, the greatest mind of the Elizabethan era, friend of Queen Elizabeth, colleague of Sir Philip Sidney, converser with angels, mathematician par excellence, determined under the influence of the mysterious Edward Kelly that he was to be the center of an alchemical renaissance and a secret society that would lay the groundwork for the continuation of the dream of Astraea, the dream built around the Elizabethan queen, Elizabeth I. He associated himself intensely with the Arthurian mythical and mystical side of the Elizabethan idea of British Empire. He was a Welshman, like the Queen he was so intensely devoted to, and like her he shared the Renaissance mood of Saturnian melancholy, a collector of books, a builder of scientific instruments, a composer of codes and ciphers, fascinated with alchemy. Dee was both the figure of the introspective melancholic and the world-planning, empire-building political visionary. Dee was under the patronage of the Earl of Northumberland and it was Northumberland who looted the Catholic monasteries at the time of Henry VIII. We have reason to believe that John Dee had virtual carte blanche in selecting manuscripts from those libraries that interested him. Not only was Dee a scholar of the classics and the magical past, but he was an intimate friend with some of the great movers and shakers of his own time, particularly Sir Philip Sidney and the entire coterie of poets and artists who had gathered themselves around Elizabeth, Astraea, to celebrate her reign and to make of her the paradigmatic sovereign of Europe that Dee believed led the way toward the establishing of a universal alchemical monarchy. It was essentially a poetic enterprise, as alchemy always is. Uh, Merlin, in the Arthurian legends, has come down to us basically disguised as John Dee. The image we have of Merlin is Dee's image. Uh, so Dee possessed an enormous uh, power over the imagination his contemporaries. They were in awe of his learning. Or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where I may oft outwatch the bear with thrice great Hermes, or unsphere the spirit of Plato to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold.
it's almost as though the alchemists, through their humility, had a deeper insight into the workings of the world than we have achieved today. The transformation of matter into a universal panacea for the redemption of mankind. This was Dee's great passion this was the overarching theme of his life, a deep, deep commitment to the reformation of society and a deep, deep uh, exhaustion and rejection of the values of Christendom that he saw betrayed all about him. And then by distillation, and then by coagulation, and then by concentration through firing, the alchemical body is brought to completion. These are processes that go on both within the chemical retort, the alembic, in the alchemist's laboratory, and they are processes which go on in the heart and mind of the alchemist. One process dissolves. Another process separates the dross, the gross matter, from the precious. Another concentrates the subtle essence. Another raises the subtle essence to another level of refinement. And over time, the great friend of the alchemist this process of rarefaction and growth, both metallic and psychological, both internal and external, uh, both personal and impersonal, proceeds and feeds upon itself, and eventually, not through any logic discernible to the scientific mind, there is a kind of miracle the production of the stone, the union of spirit and matter, the fusion of these two contradictory aspects of the universe into a new and third thing, the quintessence, the rubedo, the lapis philosophorum, the aqua vitae, the nostre lapis philosophorum de vici. I would place Dr. D at the center of this business. And then it's a dissolve to Mortlake, 1582. The angelic encounter. All you that fame philosophers would be, and night and day in Gelber's kitchen broil, wasting the chips of ancient Hermes' tree, weaning to turn them to a precious soil, the more you work, the more you lose and spoil. To you I say, how learned soe'er you be, go burn your books and come and learn of me. unusually susceptible to the claims of Edward Kelly, who came to Dee with two bona fides, a mysterious book written in hieroglyphics and a red powder, which he claimed to be a partially completed approach to the alchemical elixir. With these two bits of evidence in hand, Dee fell fully under the spell of Kelly and his scrying ability. And communing with spirits and entities discerned within, he was at last obtaining entrance into the angelic realms he had so long sought. The 
diaries of D show that over a period of years and on a daily basis, he and Edward Kelly would regularly retire to the inner chambers of D's house, first at Mortlake, and then in a series of courtly settings as they moved about Europe. And in these seances, in these settings, a vast cast of angels and voices passed in parade, always egging our protagonists deeper into the Rosicrucian enlightenment and the political dispensation that they sought. In 1583, they arrived at last in Prague. Prague at that time was ruled by Rudolf II, the occult emperor, collector of dwarves and giants, a patron of alchemy and astrology, one of the most eccentric and extravagant rulers in the entire panoply of European history. And it was to Rudolf, and it was to the people around Rudolf, and the Emperor's private secretary, Count Palatine Michael Meyer, it was to these established and renowned alchemists that Dee brought his plan and drew them forward toward the idea of an alchemical reformation. was able to lay the groundwork for events which a generation later would blossom into the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. cosmos is reflected in the mystery of man and woman, the mystery of the human mind-body interface. It's important to see D as a kind of culmination of a tradition that had been at work for over 150 years in Europe. The use of astrology, numerology, uh, Hebrew Kabbalah, and the doctrine of signatures to produce a magical theory of nature and man's place in it can be traced to a generation before D. People like Henry Cornelius Agrippa von Nettlesheim, who became the prototype for Faust, uh, tri the Bishop Trithemius, the great developer of codes and ciphers, one of these great passions. The Florentine magician Marcello Ficino, who was the great rediscoverer and promoter of the hermetic knowledge, and upon which he drew very heavily. But he took their work and added the dimension of the idea of an angelic intercession into politics of the time, essentially in support of the values of the young Queen Elizabeth and her Astrea reign. 